Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. So welcome. We're going to continue on in this new ministry season in the series that we're calling Rise Above, where we're looking at the letter called First Peter, the book of First Peter in the New Testament. So why don't you turn in your Bibles to First Peter, and it's uh, towards the very end of the Bible. Don't be afraid to use your table of contents if you need uh, some help getting there. And if you need a Bible, just raise up your hand right now, and one of our ushers will be glad to uh, let you borrow one, and you can keep it if you need to have one. So while you're turning to First Peter, I'll tell you about uh, when I was a freshman at Vanderbilt University, I decided that I would go through a process that is called fraternity rush. And where you meet a lot of people in a lot of different fraternities and then finally they give you an invitation or they don't give you an invitation. And uh, after the whole process was over, uh, on the final day, I got an invitation from the fraternity that the only one really that I had interest in thought would be, uh, you know, a, a good experience to join. But when you join the fraternity, you, you didn't just like get out your checkbook and write a check and then you're, you're in. It's not like joining a gym or something like that. Oh no, that began a process that they called pledge training which I would call hazing. And that process would last for 12 weeks. In that course of 12 weeks, the older guys worked to make the life of the several dozen of us pledges, the newbies, uh, to try to make our lives about as miserable as they could. And by thinking of every creative stupid and uh, exhausting and fatiguing and just really sort of crazy things that we had to do while we're trying to keep our grades up and all this sort of thing. And <clears throat> they tried to push the envelope as far as they could push it without getting the fraternity kicked off the campus, which I would later find out some years after I left that fraternity would get kicked off the campus. But I wasn't surprised. And, and so, <clears throat> well, anyhow, we got going along in the process, and it went for four weeks, it went for eight weeks, uh, went for 10 weeks. And about that time, I was thinking, you know what? I think I, I might just quit. I don't need this. But I hung in there, and I'm glad that I did for a couple of reasons. But one of the things that, that I learned through the experience was that there was actually behind all the craziness. There was a plan behind what the older guys were trying to do. They were trying to get us individuals who did not know each other before we became the pledge class, and in many, in some instances, didn't even particularly like each other. They were trying to get us to bond and to become brothers and to become friends. And I don't mean just like, you know, at a boy kind of friends pat on the back. Kind of, I mean like sobbing, snotty nosed, I love you brother, go, go through the mud kind of friends. Uh, that's what they were trying to create the, the need for us to do. Well, finally about the 10th or 11th week, we realized that. So we had this little powwow among ourselves and we said, you know what? They're never gonna let us get through this purgatory unless we come together and put away our isolated, individualized, proud selves and come together as a team, as a family and do this together. And that was a turning point day for us because we really did. We, we just said no more. Uh, you know, it's all about me and I'll do my own thing. It's, it's all about this team. And the older guys sat up and paid attention. And finally, they said, you're about ready and you got to go through this grueling weekend as if it hadn't been grueling enough. And, and then finally, you know, we're sleep deprived and woozy and we take off our blindfolds and they said, you're in, you made it, no more hell, welcome. And, you know, <clears throat> and, and taught us the handshake and all the stuff. And I, I couldn't even tell it to you if you asked me, so I don't even bother because I, I can't even remember what it was. But anyhow, we got through that. And several weeks later, I was talking to one of the older guys. And he said, you know, <laughs> you guys were a really stubborn class. I said, how do you figure? He said, you guys were just a bunch of proud, 
individuals. You never could figure it out. Don't you realize no pledge class has ever taken that long to finish the process? I said, really? He said, no. Some have done it as short as six. Most about eight. We had to put 10. Finally, we had to put 12. We were wanting, good grief, are we going to have to go like to the next semester? Are they ever going to figure it out? Now, I tell you that story because though that was self-inflicted hell, I think, though, there is a metaphor in that that synchronizes very nicely and applies very well to this letter that we've been reading in 1 Peter, where Peter was writing to these Christians about the hell they were going through, which was not self-inflicted and was much more serious. And he was going to tell them some things that we're going to look at today in his effort to encourage them and say, here's how you're going to get through this. So let's look in 1 Peter. We're picking up where we left off last week in chapter 1, starting in verse 22. And uh, in, just maybe in case you're fir- your first time, let me just give you a quick uh, summary of where we've been. So the, the year is right around 64 AD. There's a emperor of the whole Roman Empire, and his name is uh, Nero. And there's been a terrible fire that has destroyed uh, most of Rome, and the fire was blamed on the Christians, and the Christians never caused the fire. And so the Christians from Rome, the Christians from Jerusalem, they've all gone fleeing for their lives because it is open season on Christians. After all, if they cause that fire and ruin our lives, we're going to kill them. And so they started killing Christians and beheading them and dragging them into the Roman Colosseum and feeding them to the lions. And I mean, it was, it was a hard season for Christians. And so these Christians are gathering up anything they could grab in their hands, including their kids, and they were fleeing for the hills. And they were going as far as modern day Turkey, just to find asylum somewhere. And so here they were off in this foreign land, they're strangers, they feel like aliens, we don't belong here, just a little while ago we were in our home and then all this craziness happened and what's going on and why is this happening to us? And, And they were discouraged and they felt outnumbered and they felt outmanned. Like a lot of people I know today, in their own families and in this world of ours that sometimes feels like it's coming a little unraveled. And one day they get a letter from Peter, one of the innermost of the 12 disciples, who's now older and wiser and much less impulsive, more seasoned, more uh, balanced, stable. And he sends them this letter to encourage them off in Asia Minor. Here's how you live the Christian life victoriously. Even though I'm not denying that you're going through hell, but here's how you're gonna get through it. Let's look at what he says. Verse 22, having purified your souls by your, uh, by your obedience to the truth for a, for a, let me just start over. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and it's glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander and like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, there's three things that Peter's going to tell us in this section. If you're a note taker, here's the first one. He's saying, if you're going to get through this fire, people back then 2,000 years ago who loved Jesus, people now in this world, if you love Jesus, first thing, you're going to have to realize you are family. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are our family. Verse 23, since all of you have been born again from the same imperishable seed of the living word of God, it means you're born from the same seed, your brothers and sisters in him, your family. 
my boys now are eight and 11, and they really, 99% of the time, are the very best of friends. You could hear it if you came to our house with the banter and the playing that they do and the running around and the laughing that you hear them doing in the other um, room. And even when one's gone, the other's asking, so when's he gonna come home? You know, and, and they just really are very, very close, except for about one or 2% of the time. When they are particularly tired, or when they are, uh, you know, have been playing together for a particularly long period of time, or if one of them is hangry, that's hungry and angry at the same time, and the blood sugar is just a little, and all of a sudden it's like one of them turns into a dog and the other turns into a cat, and they go at it. I mean, they start screaming and shouting and hitting and kicking hard and yelling things that we really don't yell in our family and, and about you're going to die and I'm going to kill you and then I'm going to dance on your grave and I mean all that and, and it's at that point that Suzanne or I we got to step in we got to intervene and we have to say stop it you boys are brothers we're in the same family that means we got each other's back we're on the same team you're tired, you're hungry, knock it off. Come over here and let's, you know, we get you, because you're family. We have to do that uh, sometimes. <clears throat> You've heard the expression, I'm sure, blood is thicker than water. And by that, what the expression means, of course, is, is hey, if you're my brother or sister, um, then, you know, you can mess up, you can goof up, you, you, it, but I've still got your back. Why? Because we're family, you know, and blood is thicker than water. And what Peter is saying here is, hey, brothers and sisters, blood is thicker than water. If you're brother and sister in Christ, then you're going to have each other's back. You're family. You're on the same team. Don't forget it. He's telling them, you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, blood is thicker than what your family. He's telling them, if you don't realize this, if you don't get this, if you don't live this, then don't be surprised when the devil gets in there and starts trying to tear you all apart, pull you out like the little cart coming on the football field and taking one of you off and coming back and taking one, pull the whole team apart, injured, and the, the devil's just over in the shadows snickering. That's what he's always been doing. Don't let him do it, your family. In fact, he, 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 he's, he's going to say this whole thing about love. He's going to really lean into it. And he does a little trick with the Greek that you don't see this in English because we really only have one word for love. But Greek actually had uh, several words for love. And he's going to flip the word. He's going to start by saying, look, I, I, you show brotherly love for each other. That's a great thing. I don't want you just to show brotherly love. And he's going to add a little oomph to it. He's going to flip the word and he's going to say, I want you to show agape love for one another. What's agape love? That was the love that, of God. That, that was the word that they used to describe, this is the way God loves us with this never-ending grace, this never-ending mercy poured out on everyone whether or not they deserved it. And none of us does deserve it. He says, that's the kind of love I want you showing to one another, agape love. Now, why was he so adamant? Because he knew the devil's always been trying to get in there and to mess things up. But to counter that, he's trying to remind them, hey, Christianity has always been a revolution of love. That's always been our distinct calling card. And so in the family, we love one another. It's um, said in history uh, that there was a reporter that sought, but this is way back in the early days of Christianity, who sought to infiltrate as a spy into Christian community to, just to get the real scoop, to pull out the dirt where he come out and expose, here's what's really going on in these secret Christian meetings. And it's said that when he came out after infiltrating into the community, all he could say was, behold, how they love one another. It's like I was in there. And 
it's not phony. It's real. They really care for each other. They love it. They sacrifice. They rejoice with those who are rejoicing. They grieve with those who are grieving. I mean, they're, they're like all in for each other. And don't you know that that made the heart of our Heavenly Father pleased when a skeptic going in to infiltrate, to spy out, to bring out the dirt, could bring out nothing more than, man, these guys, they love each other. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. You know, my concern is that any reporter these days might infiltrate into any number of churches around the world and come out and say, "Um, behold, how they lacerate one another. And that's not a compliment. Something's gone wrong if we're not engaged in this revolution of love that brothers and sisters in Christ have for one another. Before he became president, Andrew Jackson served as a military man overseeing uh, the Tennessee militia. And so while he was major general, uh, they say one, uh, one season, the troop morale got so low that there was a point nearly of Mutiny, And I mean, there's bickering going on in the Tennessee militia and even literal fights uh, with one another until finally Old Hickory had to step into the middle of it and say, gentlemen, the enemy is over there. And it makes you wonder if Christ were just to pop in on us right now, if he might say the same thing. Hey, the enemy's out there. Not in here, not with the brothers and the sisters who claim my name. The enemy's out there. Suzanne and I have decided all along in our parenting, we're not going to fall on a lot of swords. Uh, and so that puts us in a posture of always praying and asking the Lord, what's your will in this situation? Because we're, we're really not legalistic about a lot of things. And try to be grace-driven. But there's one thing. We've said we're going to fall on this sword. We are going to have family dinner together. Even as the boys are getting bigger and more busier in sports and this kind of thing. At least three, hopefully four times a week, we're going to sit down at the same table and we're going to look into the whites of each other's eyes and we're going to hear the stories of what's going on in one another's lives. Why are we going to do that? Because we're family. And if we don't take the time and prioritize making that happen, you know what will happen? We will forget that we're family. And we won't act like family anymore. You actually got to come together to to remind one another, hey, we're on the same team. So we've said that's just a priority that we're not going to sacrifice that one. And, And this is what Peter is trying to emphasize to the Christians in this foreign land. He's saying, hey, you guys are born of the same seed. So you, you, if you're going to get through this, this hell you're going through over there, you're going you're to have to do it together. You're going to have to come together, put aside your differences, put aside your, your pride and your individualism. You, you're not going to prevail on your own. It's not going to happen. You're family, so you've got to come together. Which gets me thinking about this, by the way. Let me ask you, who is your spiritual family? Now, I didn't mean your, your, like your biological family or family dinner, although that's a good thing too. Now I switched it. I'm talking about who's your spiritual family? These are like the brothers and sisters in Christ in your life that you're doing life with. Who are they? I mean, who's, your, who's your group? Who's your people? Even as I say that, I know some of you are like, ah, oh, you know... I've been meaning to get in a grow group, and I know that'd be a really good thing, and it's been on my list for like two years, and, but it's just, I'm so busy, and we're going so many directions, and I just don't know if I can make time for that. And I know it'd be a good thing, but there's so many other things that are really more important, and one of these days, we're going to get in a grow group, and, and I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you really hard um, to realize something. 
if that is your mindset, you're in trouble. You say, well, I'm in trouble. Here's why you're in trouble. Because if you're not looking into the whites of the eyes of other brothers and sisters in Jesus, at least once a week, and I'm not talking about looking at the back of their heads, that's what you're doing right now. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about really some people, like the video that you're watching. If you're not doing that, if you're not being the family, the body, the team of Christ with some other people that you're encouraging and celebrating the joys and grieving the sorrows and, and getting through, if you're not doing you're going to forget who you are. You're going to forget what team you are on. And here's the reality. Because you are going to huddle up with any number of other teams throughout the week. But those aren't the teams of Christians. Those are the teams of work, of school, of stuff you got to get done. I'm saying those are bad teams. They're teams that you just got to do. But if those are the only teams that you're huddling with, friends, that's all you're going to be thinking about. Your mind is not going to be renewed with the reality and the reminder, I'm a follower of Jesus. You're going to be like the wide receiver who goes out on every play, runs the wrong pass route. Finally, you say, what the heck? Why do you run the wrong pass route? Well, I never go to the huddle. Oh, well, that would explain it. If you don't ever go to the huddle, if you don't have some brothers and sisters in Christ that you're doing life with, you will. It's, it's, it's only a matter of time, and it's a surprisingly short period of time. Trust me, I've been doing this a long time. I've watched people. I've watched them come in here. They, they hear about the gospel. They hear about how God loves them and sent Jesus and dies on the cross, and, the, and they're like, oh, my gosh, he loves me. Yes, he loves you, and he trusts Christ, and, and maybe they get plugged in for a few months, and good things are happening, and God's answering prayers, and the life is changing, but then they get busy, and then they, I don't see them so much, and then I hear about the group that they're in, yeah, they hadn't come in about three months or four, and we called them, and we went over, and said, well, he's just so busy, and, one, and then I hear through the grapevine, you know, you know they, they just, he kind of lapsed back into this, you know, I'm like, not one bit the dust, forgot who he was, forgot who she was. You got to you got to come to the huddle. You got to have a team. That's what Peter was telling these guys. That's why I'm really excited that today is an opportunity. It's one of those on-ramp kind of Sundays where we just say, "Hey, stay 10 minutes and go around and and meet some of the people and some of the grow groups, pick up some of their little cards and ask them like when you meet and and just say, "You know what? We're going to go. We're going to go try a couple and see if we might not like the video. Like we might find our people that we could kind of do life with. This is an on-ramp Sunday. Don't miss it. And, and if you're over in the West Center Court, um, it's not that atrium. There's another very cool thing. That's a youth ministry uh, missions. It's called The Road. That, that's, the, that's the different thing that they're signing up for. It's over on the east side. If you're in the woodlands, it's outside the curtain. So don't miss that. Take, take a few minutes and and leverage the opportunity. Let's get you connected in. So that's the first thing. You've got to realize your family. Second thing he says in this passage, you've got to declare war on the unity destroyers. If you're going to get through this purgatory you're going through, you're going to have to declare war on the, purga- on the, on the unity destroyers. What are the unity destroyers? Well, he's going to give us five. It's not an exhausted li- exhaustive list. I mean, there's a sixth and a seventh and a 20th and an 80th. It's a, it's a representative list, but it captures, these five words capture a lot of stuff that the devil will use to tear Christians apart. Let's look at the list briefly. The first one is malice. How are you doing on malice? Any number of you are like, check, I don't do that, because deep down you're like, I don't know what that is. What does that word mean, malice? Well, I did a little work, a little word study, and I'll tell you what it means. Malice is the desire to cause harm to someone else. You say, oh, so it's kind of like anger. No, it's even worse than anger. Because at least when somebody's angry, it's all out there in the open, and we both know what's going on. You're angry. And then we're going to talk about ways to express that appropriately. That's a different talk. But, But malice... Malice is, I'm going to smile at you, but when you're not looking, the dagger is going straight into you. 
I'm going to cause you harm. And Peter's saying, you guys, if you're going to get through this, you, could, you got you got to get, be done with that. you got to sweep that out. He's a, you get rid yourself. It's, it's like he's saying, you're, if your clothes are on fire, you got to tear those, you got to strip those burning clothes off. you got to get that stuff off. No malice, he's saying. That's toxic stuff. Then he's going to talk about deceit, being deceitful, not being honest, um, exaggerating, manipulating, being deceitful. He's like, you can be certain that that will tear up the team. You cannot do that. You got to strip that out. You got to sweep that out. You got to get rid of it. That's toxic stuff. Hypocrisy. That's the third one he mentions. What's hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is pretending to be somebody that you're not. And, and he's going to say, you'll never have real community, life changing, soul sustaining community if, if you're being phony. That's why here at Faithbridge, we've said, hey, we want to be a place where people, real people, real life. Where we can just say, hey, you know what? I'm wrestling with this. I got a problem uh, with that. And, you know, it's an addiction. I've been having a struggle with this for 20 years. And um, Okay, well, good. Let's get it out in the open. Hurts, habits, hangups, let's get it out there so we can deal with it. You know, that's why we say here at Faith Ridge often, it's okay to not be okay. What's not okay is to say, I'm okay, and to pretend you're okay when deep down you know, I'm not okay. Okay? So we can't do that. He's saying you got to strip that stuff off. Hypocrisy. Then envy. What's envy? That's combining an awareness of something that somebody has with your desire to possess it. You know, like when a friend gets a promotion that you really thought you should have gotten or uh, a friend or a, a sibling gets, you know, a new car, a new house that you really thought you deserved it. And you're like, that should have been mine. And he's saying that, that is going to tear the body up. You got to be done with that. And remember, Peter's already told us, we talked about it two weeks ago. Look, if you have Christ inside of you, you are headed towards endless Hope, you're headed towards an eternity of hope. So this little life is but a little smidgen of time. In fact, I was pondering this yesterday and I wrote something down. I'm gonna read it to make sure I can, I think it comes out clear. Let me try it on you. If all of life's years represent mere minutes in the eternal continuum of time. All your 70 years, 80 years, if you get to live that long, represent just minutes, not years, minutes in God's eternal uh, continuum of time. Then what's the big deal if somebody that you know, somebody you love, somebody you're related to, you know, gets to have something, buy something, own something, enjoy something, that you didn't get to enjoy, have, buy, own, for what will amount to nothing more than a few seconds in eternity. When you think about it that way, don't you see how silly it is to give in to envy? In the eternal scheme of things, that's all you got that. It amounts to a few seconds of time in eternity. So rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Don't dive into the pit of mud and just say, we're going to get all worked up. And envious that tears up the body. And then the fifth one. I think this is perhaps the most dangerous of all slander. What is this? This is speaking against somebody. And I've long been convinced that this is the one, not that the devil doesn't use all these, but that he really loves to use this one, especially when there's a vibrant body of believers to, to get one to slander another. I was reminded of a story that I read years ago. It had to do with uh, a lady and the, the things that she'd been saying 
in her community about her pastor and about her uh, church. And they were, they were wrong. They were cutting. They were misleading. Um, but she would perpetuate these uh, things. Finally, one day, God's Holy Spirit must have got a hold of her. And she came to her senses and she felt overcome with uh, feeling guilty and convicted of what she'd been doing. So she went and had an appointment and met with the pastor and, and said to the pastor, I, I need to confess to you something. He said, okay. She said, it's the th stuff that I've been saying about you. And I've been saying it a lot. And, you know, she just got it all out there and he listened and then smiled warmly. And he said, well, thank you for coming in and for being honest. And I just want you to know that I forgive you. But now I want you to do something. She's like, okay. He said, I want you to go home and I want you to get a feather pillow. And I want you to slice open the pillow. And I want you to pour all the feathers out of the pillow into a basket. And I want you to bring the basket here. She thought, well, that's a little weird, but okay. I'll do it. I'm sure there's some good from it. So she goes home, does the feather and the pillow and the basket and brings them and says, here's the, the feathers. And he says, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to go to the hill over there in the middle of our village and I want you to take the basket of feathers and I want you to hurl the basket of feathers into the wind. She said, okay. So she went out, throws the, brings the basket back and he says, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to go back out with the basket and I want you to retrieve all of those feathers and put them all back in the basket. At which point, of course, she said, that's impossible. <laughs> They've blown here, there, and everywhere. And he said, that's quite right. He said, so while I forgive you for what you've done, I do want you to realize that your words are like feathers. Once you throw them into the wind, no matter how much you would like to bring them back, you can't. They've blown out there. I think that's a good word for Christians, especially uh, just with all the social media that goes out. It's so, so easy to just... Our feathers just, just go everywhere. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. Some of you are thinking, right, well, but sometimes don't you have to say something? I mean, you should say something sometimes. Yes, you should. And especially if there's an instance where you know that there's uh, uh, um, abuse going on or total dishonesty or uh, thievery or you know, whatever. You, sure, you've got to say something. But here's a good litmus test. I'll give you three things. Just a good litmus, litmus test that I think would serve us all well if we'd run this through your grid before you tweeted the next thing out. You can tweet this out, tweet this out. Though. All right, the first one is this. Is it true? Is what I just heard true? Well, you know, I heard it. But, you know, no, 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 no. I didn't say was it hearsay. Have you investigated it? Have you explored the veracity of it really? Or are you just blowing along more feathers that you just happened along to, to, to encountering. Is it true? The second one is, is it fair? Have you really dug in and is, I mean, you gotta hear the other side. There's always another side to the story. Have you, have you got a balanced report of what's going on? Is it fair? And then the third one, and this is maybe the most important, is it necessary? Is it necessary that I say it? Now, again, in some instances, it is necessary, even legally necessary. you got to say some things. But in many instances, I'm afraid it, uh, that we modern-day Christians, uh, we flub it up on all three of these. Many times, we don't know if it's true. It certainly maybe it's not fair. And it most assuredly, many times, it wasn't necessary in fact, Richard Foster uh, writes in one of his books years ago, he, he said, there is such a thing called the ministry of charity, and Christians should practice the ministry of charity liberally. Now, you say, what's the ministry of charity? The ministry of charity is exactly this number third one, where he was saying, oh, there'll be plenty of times where you will hear something and you will find out it is true, and it is balanced, you got the whole story, I mean, it's even fair. But it's this third one. Is it really necessary for you to, to get in and hold the feathers and throw the feathers? Was it really necessary? He said, Christians would do well to practice the ministry of charity. 
where in those instances, you just say, you know what? Ah, I don't need to talk about it with anybody. I don't need to tweet it out to anybody. You know, it's probably out there plenty. And where we rise above that. So Peter's uh, saying uh, in verse one, you've got to put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. If you, if you want to get through this hell you're going through, people, you're going to have to come together as family. You're going to have to sweep out all that junk. And then here's the third and final one. Fill yourself up with something better. Fill yourself up with something better better. What is better? Look at verse two. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. Now what is the pure spiritual milk? It's the word of God. It's the Bible. He's saying you, 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 gotta, you gotta be craving God's word to get into you. And I know some of you know your Bibles well enough to you say, okay, I'm a little confused by that because I know Paul comes along at another point and he talks about the milk, but you shouldn't just only, you should move on and get solid food and the meat of God's word. Peter's just gonna keep it simple. He's like, I'm not throwing multiple pic- word pictures. I'm just using one. The pure milk of God's word. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Pure spiritual milk. And by the way, you realize <laughs> he's not paying us a compliment here <laughs> in this portion. Or if you don't realize it, you're going to realize it now because I'm going to explain it to you. He was telling those people and he's telling us. He's saying, you're babies. Like newborn infants. He's saying, you it's like your babies over there in modern day Turkey and over in spring tech. It's like you're a bunch of spiritual babies. You need to be craving. You, you need to be craving pure spirit. You need to get filled with God's word. Now, here's the reality. Many people come to saving faith later in life, maybe when they're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And it was only then that, you know, the dots got connected and they're like, Oh, so we're sinners, yes. And God sent his son to die on the cross for me too. Yes. And he'll be your substitute, yes. And you know, they, they finally get it. But here's the challenge. Any number of people who trust Christ as, a, as adults, they, many times, especially if they're 30, 40, 50, older, they've already achieved some good things in life. Maybe they built a business, maybe they made good money, maybe they had a big house, cars, family, all that stuff. And so in their minds, they think, well, I've done all these things well, so now I'm a Christian, I must be doing that well. They don't realize, no, 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 the moment you trusted in Christ, you became a baby at this thing called your Christian faith. Your earthly accomplishments don't translate in the spiritual kingdom. So you don't just come in a veteran, varsity, I'm just, that's what I am. It's what I've done all my life. So I'm, I'm just, I'm on that team, even in the Christian. No, you're a baby is what Peter's telling them. Now, what do we know about babies? Literally. Well, and, and we'll, we'll expand it. Just not only just little babies, but just move up to the, the little ones that start really showing their personality. What happens? Well, they jump around a lot. They, they just always bouncing around. It's hard for them to stay regulated. They get dysregulated all the time and, and they're selfish and they're self-centered. It's all about me and the thoughts never occurred to them that maybe the world doesn't revolve around them. You know, that's a foreign thought to, to any little one. And if they don't get what they want, then their feelings get hurt and they flop down on the floor and they throw a fit. And, and you know, they're, they're not the ones ever making contributions to the, the, the family system. No, no. They're benefiting from the contributions that mom or dad and other grown-ups are making into this system. And they just want to continue to feel good. And they're going to have a fit if they don't feel good. That's what we know, right, uh, uh, about little ones. Now, in a very real way, don't you see what Peter's saying is, there's a lot of Christians. You're still spiritual babies. Oh, you're 60, but you're still a Spiritual baby, look at the Christians, especially in American Christianity. They jump around a lot. They don't sit still. They go here, they go there. We'll go try over there. We're going to go down to that church. We'll go over here. We'll get in that group. Nah, we'll move on. And, and, and they, never, they never like settle down. 
and they fill their minds with a lot more junk than the spiritual word of spiritual milk of God's word. I mean, they're watching TV and meandering down the tentacles of social media for hour upon hour. You say, well, how does that line up in terms of hours per week that you're reading God's word? It doesn't even compare. They're, they're, no, no, no wonder you still stay in a spiritual baby. It's like they're consumers of, of their Christian faith. And, you know, they, they, they come in and sometimes they have a little fit if this wasn't right or if this was too loud or whatever. They didn't set that out. And what's wrong with this place? And, and if you don't change this or if you don't start one of those because we really need one of those, then I'm just going to storm out and I'm going to leave and I'm going to go find another place. Really, you're, just, you're telling me a lot about your spiritual Maturity, Peter's saying. A lot of American Christians are still baby Christians. They, they never fed themselves, learned how to feed themselves on this, the pure milk of God's word. And they're still spiritual babies, even though they might say, I've been a follower for 40 years. But here's the reality, friends. You, you could trust in Christ and then you could go and sit in a church faithfully every Sunday for 40 years looking at the backs of people's heads sitting in front of you. And that will not grow you as a believer any more than driving over to the bank, walking in, sitting down at the lobby for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes every week, reading a few magazines, waving at a few people, getting up, walking out of that bank for 40 years after doing it weekly is going to make you a millionaire. You're going to have to invest yourself. You're going to actually have to say, you know what, I, I got to move deeper into this thing. I've got to get in touch with God's word. I've got to start learning. What does it mean to read God's word and, and to think the thoughts of God and to memorize God's word and then to get in community, to find my team where I've, I've got some people I'm in the huddle with and, and I'm asking these questions. I've got these questions. And I got to spend some time in this huddle, not just these other huddles that, that I've I got to spend my time in. And i got to... I need to replace some of the hours that I'm watching mindless TV and spending wasted hours on social media. I need to be studying God's word. Why? Garbage in, garbage out. Pure milk in, healthy stuff out. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just pretty simple. Back when I was in my uh, college years and starting to feel the call of ministry, one of my mentors was Dr. Bill Hinson, and he's gone on to heaven, but he was a, he was a great preacher and role model and mentor for me. And, and he told a story of how when his son, John, uh, was a little one that they went to the pediatrician, and then when John became a middle schooler, they continued to go to the pediatrician. They just liked the pediatrician, liked the doctor, and he knew them all. And then when he, John, uh, moved into high school, he kept going to the pediatrician and never moved on and found another doctor. And, and so one day, uh, Dr. Henson said that John, who was 17, had driven himself to the clinic uh, for whatever ailment uh, he had. He's sitting in the waiting room by himself, and this little precocious one, uh, who's very talkative, s s starts walking around the perimeter of the room and all the colorful chairs and putting a hand on each uh, little baby's knee, sitting in mommy's and daddy's laps, and, and the baby continued to go progressively one by one. Baby, baby, baby. But finally gets to 17-year-old to John, sees him sitting by himself, puts his hand on him and goes, looking him up and down. Big baby. <laughs> and I think that's what Peter was telling us here. There's, there's a lot of big babies in this thing called Christian faith. And he's saying it shouldn't shock you if you feel like the flames of the hell you're going through are starting to devour you. you you're not going to get through this until you say, I'm going to replace this nonsensical stuff 
with the pure milk of God's word. I'm going to get filled up with that so that it'll push out the malice and the envy and the slander and the hypocrisy. And all, I, I got to fill up with this good stuff and, and so that I can have a heart full of the gospel love working inside of me that he's put there that, we might, that I might be a valuable team member in the body of Christ making contributions to the deal. Not acting like a baby, just consuming it, but actually actually investing in this thing and, and bringing other people along in the journey. He was saying, so sure, Christians over in modern day Turkey, you're going through hell, but here's how you're going to get through it. Don't be absorbed by that stuff that's going on around you and happening even to you. You've got to put your mind on Christ and his word and get in his community and fill up with his stuff because what comes out of one's mouth is just a, simply a reflection of what you have fed your heart and filled your heart with. Last story. So several months ago, I uh, was with my two boys and they had a friend uh, and I was after a sporting thing or something, I don't remember. And, and it was evening time. And so the, one of them said, let's go eat dinner and proposed the place. Let's go to Texas Roadhouse. I said, actually, that's a great idea because I have a gift card, $50 gift card I got, and we'll go to the Texas Roadhouse. So we go to the Texas Roadhouse, which is a fun place if you have a little people if you've never been there because it's, they played loud music and, and you can throw your peanut shells on the floor and that's really kind of fun. And, and, and so um, we're sitting there in a booth and the, they three wanted to sit together. So they're packed in that booth and I'm over here on this side by myself. And, and the lady comes up and she brings this basket of the, the softest, gushiest, butteriest, bestest yeast bread rolls you ever had. But see, I can't eat that stuff anymore. And so I don't. And, and, <clears throat> and with it, they have these little dishes of this cinnamon honey butter. And the boys just, you know, they're into those bread rolls and they grab the, the little honey butter and you know, and they're just eating all this stuff. And meanwhile, the lady comes back with our drinks and she's like, wow. She puts another uh, basket of the bread rolls down and they, they're over those again. And, and um, so I place the order and we're going to have this and this and this and I'm going to have a, a grilled chicken salad and no bread rolls and, and <clears throat> honey butter. And, and so a few minutes later, um, she comes back and, and she brought us, I think, a third basket of bread rolls. And, and she sets down our plates of food. And at which point I said, okay, guys, let's say a blessing. I'll pray. And so I prayed. And, and, and as soon as I said amen, I looked up and all three of those guys were like, they were in a honey butter coma. And, <laughs> and I said, well, come on, guys, let's eat. Now, you know, it's here. And they're like, I'm not hungry anymore. You know, and one of them tried really hard and, and sort of eh, took a bite or two. And, and I said, no, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm spinning my gift card. We came here. You guys, y'all have bread rolls and honey butter. I forgot to tell you, one, this was really nice. When, at one point, when, when I looked over, glanced over, one of, one of my boys had his tongue just smushed up inside the little honey butter dish and I just plastered in there, just licking the honey butter. And... <clears throat> And so I, I said to the lady, would you, could you bring us several to-go boxes? Because I don't think we're even going to get to, to this stuff. And at which point, Wesley uh, sort of s s served as the spokesperson for all three of them. And he said, Dad, those bread rolls and that honey butter, it's so good. He says, but I think maybe the next time that we come here, you should tell the lady why don't you save all the bread rolls and the honey butter till after we've eaten the real food? And of course he was right. That's a good plan. And that's exactly what Peter was saying to these Christians. He was saying, if you would just fill yourself with the word of God, you will be then infused with the good stuff, the nourishment, 
And that will drive all of this other stuff out so that when you're in the huddle, when you're on that team that is the body of Christ, you'll be a functioning team, a healthy team, helping one another get through the hell that life can bring. It was like he was saying, so serve the healthy stuff. Fill up on that stuff first. And don't put that junk into you. Because if you do, the team will be torn up. The devil will win every time. And you'll be puzzled. Why is life so cotton big and hard? Why is the hell flame always devouring? Well, it has a lot to do with the choices that you made. So Peter is saying to them and to us today as well, let's be that team full of love, family. Get rid of that stuff. Fill up on the good stuff. Let's step out of the playpen of babyhood and move into being the individuals, the Christians, the believers, the church that God always had in mind that we would be. Let's pray. Lord, won't you do that now in our midst? I pray, God, that even in the next few minutes, any number of people would take a concrete step and stop by the tables at the meet and greet, that they would take seriously the need to get on a team, to have some people they're doing life with, that they might uh, look online for some of our devotional tips, that they might begin to prioritize spending time in the Word and filling up with the pure milk of your word so that all the other contaminants that the devil has been long working to bring into every believer's life and certainly non-believer's lives might have no room, just wouldn't be able to fit. I pray, God, that you would do a great thing in each heart here and in our midst collectively. And we ask all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre, and welcome to Postscript. I am here with Pastor Ken Warline, who just delivered another message on our first Peter series. Ken, thank you so much sure. for being here with us today. We had a few questions uh, roll in, okay. and the first question uh, acknowledged the need for Christians to love one another and to love one another well, but then they asked, how do we love someone who is particularly difficult to love? We all have those people in our lives sure. who just really yeah. rub us the wrong way or get on our nerves or sometimes that even offend us in some kind yeah. of way. How do we love those people well? Sure. Well, of course, we ought to re realize also we might be that person to somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> so how would we want to be loved? A couple of thoughts come to mind. First of all, I have always found it helpful to start praying for that person. Mm -hmm. And not once, not twice, but... I remember years ago in seminary, uh, one of my mentors said, when you've got an unlovable person in your life, you're going to have to pray for them faithfully for 30 days at least. Don't miss a one. And something interesting does happen when you begin to pray for somebody. And I'm not talking about, and Lord, won't you call down plagues <laughs> upon them? Not that kind of prayer. Um, but genuinely asking God to pour out blessings upon them to, you know, um, something happens and that is your heart will grow softer mm -hmm. to them. And so I would say start there. Begin to just really become intentional about praying for the person. Then the second thing is, I think in instances like that, there is a place for boundary setting. Absolutely. And... Uh, sort of defining to yourself and maybe even to the individual if 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 it's possible sort of here's inbounds and here's out of bounds right um 
and you're not saying my love is contingent upon your staying in bounds and not going out of bounds, not necessarily. Um, but there is for your own sanity and health, I believe, a good thing uh, to be experienced when we ourselves know sort of here's what's in bounds and out of bounds and, and here's what I'm gonna do to keep myself healthy from getting sucked into whatever dysfunction or the unlovable quality it is that right. uh, characterizes their life, which can become contagious, Absolutely. let's not forget. Um, and that leads to a third thing, bring that uh, situation into the confidence of your, of your team, yeah. of your spiritual family, of your small group, uh, and have them be praying for you and for that person, that there might be uh, a breakthrough, a healing, um, you, you know, something that would, that there might be some progress. Absolutely. Yeah, well, and a lot of times they can help you even come up with creative ways you <laughs> that you can resolve conflict or set those boundaries sure. um, or things like that. Yeah. And so- Or and, speaking from their own experiences. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if it's a person of wisdom and biblical, biblical biblically founded. Absolutely. Community is so helpful yeah. in those instances. Mm -hmm. uh, in your sermon, you talked about the necessity for us to become spiritually mature, to not stay infants, yeah. Christian infants. Yeah. Right. And in doing so, you alluded to people who seem to not be able to stay in one place. They just, they just keep moving around. They keep, they keep moving churches. ADHD. AD, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> were you talking about church shopping there? What were you referring to sure. there? Oh, well, I'm not talking about ADHD literally. Right. Um, well, yeah, maybe not church shopping, but church hopping. Okay. So let's differentiate. When a person or a family or a couple moves into a community, you're going to need to do a little church shopping. Sure. And so you ask around with the people that you work with and your neighbors and you find out, well, this is a good church you might want to try. And this is, a, they really preach the Bible and you know, so on. So you're going to make your little list and you're going to visit some places, maybe try out a, a, a grow group or, you know, even some of the things that they sort of specialize in if every church kind of has a niche. But there is inherent with the concept of church shopping, a destination in mind. Right. There, th th we're not just going to shop forever. We're, um, we're, we're trusting God is big enough and good enough to put us someplace and it won't be perfect because there's no perfect place, exactly. uh, church, and because there's no perfect people. But we're going to find the one that, that seems to be speaking to our souls and helping if, if we have family with the family the best and, and we're going to anchor ourselves there. I think the, 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 the thing that I was more referring to or alluding to is something that you see in American Christianity, as I understand it, more than you see in international Christianity. And this is the untethered Christian who just hops. Right. And it's almost as if they're saying, oh, I know everything the Bible says about community and what we were talking about today, the family and blood relative, but I'm above that. So I'll go where I want to go. I'll stay when I want, I'll leave when I want to. And, and so it's like they're hoppers. Right. And I don't see any biblical foundation for that because the church was nothing in biblical times if not this anchored uh, place where the Christians were tethering themselves to each other. And as Peter was teaching them once again, this is how you get through this world of persecution. Um, not by acting somehow that you're above all of that right. and that you, I don't need that and I'll just treat it like anything else in my life. I'm in charge of it. And, I'll keep it as long as I like it, and then I'll just chunk it when I'm done with absolutely. it. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's absolutely. biblical. I know it's not biblical. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, it's hard to get plugged into any kind of family or community. If, right. if you have that almost self-righteous air about you, sure. or as soon as you see something that you don't agree with, and it's like, well, I'm out, you know, find yep. the next right. church, and then you just keep doing that. And 
uh, nothing's ever going to be, like you said, I don't perfect. Think it's a, I don't think it's a good pattern. No. I don't think it's a healthy thing. No, absolutely yeah. not. And then it, in that same uh, moment of your sermon, we were talking about spiritual maturity. Mm-hmm. Um, you referenced the need for us to fill ourselves up with um, spiritually the milk of nourishing. God's word. Yeah, right, absolutely. the nourishment of God's word, sure. And so what does that look like for you practically? How do you feed mm-hmm. yourself yeah. spiritually? Well, years ago, I was introduced to an acrostic that is still my preferred way of doing devotions. It's not the only way of doing devotions. It's a tool that I'd love to put in everybody's toolbox, though. And it's called the SOAP, S-O-A-P method. And a mentor of mine, Wayne Cordero, uh, taught it to me about a decade ago. And uh, not that I hadn't had plenty of other devotional tools in my toolbox and still do, but it, when I learned that one, I really that really became a preferred tool. Rather than go through the whole thing, I would refer people to, um, you can really probably just Google soap, sure. devotion. Um, I've written an article on it. Uh, Wayne has written a, a lot of things on it. And if you go to the version right. app, get that app on your iPhone, um, there's, there's that uh, sort of method for right. doing devotions and getting into God's Word and about a thousand others. There's, there's so many different ways. So take an afternoon and, and just read through some of these uh, devotional plans. But the main thing is get on some plan right. that will put a diet put you on the diet of God's word right. where you're getting to it every day yeah. and feeding on that and putting that into your mind. And if you're not a reader and if you're a driver and you commute and a lot of people commute in Houston, sure. listen to it. You can get, hear it in every version now online sure. and, and d- drive along and, on your commute and listen to God's word and get that into your mind instead of just all of the m- mental chewing gum stuff that we listen to on the radio and watch right. on TV and everything like that. Yeah, let Morgan Freeman read you the Bible. Yeah, that there you be, go. That's right. That's, that's <laughs> absolutely. Right. Well, Pastor Ken, thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.